receive it. Anybody ready to receive the second wave? Let's welcome to the pulpit our superintendent of the District of Kansas, Brother Morell Cornwell. Let's, let's give him a warm hand as he comes. Okay. Hallelujah. Turn to five people and say, may the blessings of God be upon your life. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. How could anybody not love Jason Pagan? Oh, hello. He probably wouldn't tell you this, but he's probably the most obedient pastor in the state of Kansas. Amen. I love Jason Pagan. I love this guy. I, sometimes our transparency may get us in trouble, but our transparency helps a lot of people. It sure, it sure does. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Oh, hallelujah. Amen. Why don't you please be seated? Uh, I want to give honor, first of all, to uh, this district, to the ministers of this district. I want to give honor to our district board. We have got a great district board. I want to give honor to Brother Hill House. Uh, he has served our district and has served me these many years, and I deeply appreciate him. Uh, we honored Brother and Sister Khan last night. I, I tell you what, I was overcome uh, as we honored Brother and Sister Khan last night for their not just their superintendent service, but for their 46 years of serving this district. And he is the senior pastor in Kansas. He is older than I am. <laughs> Hallelujah. Amen. And uh, we deeply appreciate them. I uh, appreciate our local church. And uh, I, I, I love the United Pentecostal Church. Amen. I love the United Pentecostal Church. If you'll give me an opportunity to say a few things before I preach this morning, I'm, I'm very thankful that we brought Brother Scoggins to our district. Uh, uh, he has become a fixture. Uh, we brought him out here pheasant hunting. And now he's addicted to Kansas. And uh, thank you. A number of years ago, I had a pastor call me. And he said, Pastor, we got a good church. He said, uh, God blessed us financially. We're doing good. He said, but we have become very stagnant. And he said, I, <clears throat> I haven't seemed to get the church off a high center. I took a good church. We have not grown. And he said, I don't know what's wrong. He said, could I pay you to come and troubleshoot our church for about four days? And I said, well, I'm not a troubleshooter, but I said, I will come and see if I can help you. So I went to his church. He picked me up, and we went to his church, and I was going to preach four nights for them. And it, during the day, we was going to talk to all the department heads. And, and uh, I was doing, trying to do a diagnosis of his congregation, which I'm not comfortable with doing. But he asked me to do it, so I did. And the first night, we walked into church. And, and the second night, and uh, so at the end of the week, when he took me back to the airport, I was on a way. He said, well, he said, uh, can you help me understand why we are not growing? And I said, I'll send you a report when I get back home. I didn't want to give him that report there that day. He said, well, why can't you give it to me now? I said, you and I are friends. I want to be at 
friends with you at least till I get on the airplane. And I said, I'll send you a report of my findings. And he was, that's what he paid me for. He didn't pay me to preach. He paid me to come and diagnose. And uh, so we stopped at the airport. He said, look, he said, I'm, I'm a big boy. He said, can you at least give me something in a nutshell to help me before you leave? He said, why aren't we growing? So we got money. We got buildings. We got everything in order. Why aren't we growing? And I said, <clears throat> against my better judgment, I can sum it up in one statement. He said, okay. He said, why aren't we growing? I said, because of you. Well, that ended our friendship right there. And he, I said, you are paying me to be honest. I said, you are the reason this church is not growing. He said, what do you mean by that? I said, the first night we got to church, we walked in and there was a little girl came up to you and tried to get your attention. And she pulled at your coattail. And I said, I watched you slap her hand away. I watched you not give her the time of day. You was afraid the little snot coming out of her nose might get on your freshly pressed suit that you wear so precise. And everything in the church was so precise. In your home, everything is so precise. Well, I said, I instantly discerned that you are so professional that you're doing everything out of professionalism and nothing out of the love of God. I said, it would have hurt you to knelt down and wipe that little child's nose and hug her. I said, you don't love your people. You are using your people to build your ministry. Why don't you use your ministry to build people? And we have a choice as to whether we want to use people as a stepping stone or we can help build great stones for Christ. Can I have a witness, somebody? And so with that in mind, I want you to open your Bible to 1 Kings chapter 17 for just a few minutes. Uh, I won't hold you long. I'm not as long-winded as the last preacher. Uh, hallelujah. I'm picking it, Brother Pagan. That was not too long. I'm just picking. Praise God. But uh, I, I tell our church, I said, I'm going to be short tonight. And everybody starts laughing. And I said, because you laughed, I'm not going to be short. <laughs> First Kings chapter, chapter 17. And Elijah the Tishbite who was of the inhabitants of Gilead, said unto Ahab, Ahab is the king, as the Lord God of Israel liveth before whom I stand, there shall not be dew nor rain these years, but according to my word. Please be seated. I'm going to speak for just a few minutes on the anatomy of, of a breakthrough, the anatomy of a breakthrough. A number of years ago, they invented a, a shoe called Hush Puppies. Does anybody remember the Hush Puppy shoes? Has anybody ever bought a pair of Hush Puppies? They became, they became the most popular shoe in America. Everybody that's anybody owned a pair of hush puppies. But what a lot of people don't know about the hush puppy is that when it became famous, it was also very old. It was not an instant success. 
For a fact, I wore hush puppies a long time before anybody else wore hush puppies because only nerds <laughs> wore hush puppies. They were the most comfortable shoe you could buy, but they were the god-awful, ugliest shoe you've ever laid eyes on. But they were comfortable, and they were soft. And by the time the shoe became famous, it was a very old shoe. For a fact, they were going to quit making the hush puppies. And, and they had written it off as a total failure with their design until the right person from Hollywood, a famous actor, was having feet problem, and some nerd recommended the hush puppy to him. And against his better judgment, he bought a pair of hush puppies and was seen in public wearing hush puppies. And within the next 90 days, a hush puppy ran out of shoes. They had sold so many, and it became the most widespread shoe ever worn. The man that wrote the book, The Tipping Point, you can read this from the book, The Tipping Point, uh, talked about the fact that, that everybody, to be successful, has a point in their life where they rest on the precipice of whether they're going to be a failure or a success. And there's a tipping point. I call it a breakthrough. You may have pastored for years. You may have lived for God for years. You may have not seen what you dreamed that you need to see. And so many times people quit just short of their breakthrough. Amen. Elijah was a Tishbite. Steps out on the scene as a nobody. We don't know how long he was a great prophet before this moment. And when he stepped out, I've, I've, I've done a lot of studies about Elijah. I've asked psychiatrists to, to analyze Elijah. And I had one psychiatrist, I described Elijah to him without telling him who he was. And I asked him, I said, do you have a diagnosis for Elijah? He said, well, it sounds to me like he's schizophrenic. And he's definitely psychotic. And he has a manic depressant disorder. All three of those things would, would, would tell you that he is going to be a rank failure in his life. And it also tells me that no matter what kind of problems you have in your personal life, that you're not a failure until you declare your own self a failure. If God can use a, a psychotic, schizophrenic, manic depressant, he can use anybody. You don't have to be educated to, to be a great preacher. You don't have to be a great orator to build a great church. It has nothing to do uh, with your abilities, your gifts, or your talent. I think sometimes uh, it depends on our persistence uh, as to whether we want to reach our goals or not. Can I have an amen to somebody? Praise God. And when you look at Elijah, uh, he steps out on the edge of time and tells Ahab the king, hey, it's not going to rain, but according to my word. He, uh, he, Elijah didn't even have a brain. Does he think that when he stops the rain that it's not going to affect him? And God directs him down to the brook of Kedron, uh, uh, and there he said, I, uh, I've commanded the birds to feed you. He goes down by the brook, uh, and, and the buzzards or the ravens uh, feed him. Now, you can say what you want to, but Elijah is going to experience a, a lot of miracles uh, before he has his breakthrough. Now, 
Believe me, I have been so hungry at times that I would have welcomed a buzzer to bring me a McDonald's quarter pounder. And I would have claimed that to be a miracle. And it was a miracle. When the birds came and brought him his food uh, uh, twice a day, uh, I don't know if you, about you, but I've never had a buzzer to bring me anything to eat. I've never had a raven feed me. Now, I have, I have fed many a bird. I, 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 I buy peanuts by the 45-pound bags. I buy corn by the 40-pound uh, bags. I buy bird seed by the 40-pound bags. I have a little slab out behind my house. Every morning, I get four coffee cans full of seed, of, of peanuts, of corn, of bird seed, uh, and, uh, and sunflower seed. Uh, I, I have fed uh, tons of uh, of bird seed on that slab. I enjoy watching the birds eat what I feed them, but I've never had one of them offer to feed me back. And they have become such pets, uh, I won't shoot them, praise God. And, uh, and, and then the coons uh, uh, start eating my feed. I used to shoot coons, uh, but all of a sudden I'm feeding 23 coons uh, on my back slab. I hadn't even had a coon feed me lately, praise God. And, 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 and so it's an absolute miracle that Elijah has, is being fed by the ravens. And then, and then the brook dries up. Boy, was Elijah upset that the brook dried up. But he said with his own words, it's not going to rain, but according to my word. You better be careful what you start prophesying because you might suffer from your own prophetic utterance. Can I have an amen? And then he has to go through the act of humiliation. He goes down to the widow's house. And she's making, she's gathering sticks to cook a last meal. And Elijah says, bake me a cake first. Boy, would MSNBC like to get a hold of that one. Would CNN love to say, yeah, look at that, look at that pastor. Uh, he's uh, fleecing the people dry. And uh, he said, make me a cake first. And, and you know the story as well as I do of how the woman said, I've got just a little bit of oil in a, in a cruise. I've got just a little bit of meal in a barrel. She said, my son and I, we're going to eat, make one last cake. We're going to eat this cake, and then we're going to die. He said, you cook me a cake first. And she makes the cake and delivers it to the prophet. He eats the cake. And when she goes back to the meal barrel, there's meal there. And there's always oil there. And it lasted for three and a half years of the famine and the oil never stopped and the meal never ceased. Can I have an amen to that? Amen. Praise God. So, but yet that was not Elijah's a breakthrough that had yet still not made him a great prophet because these miracles uh, he sees only from his own eyes. Nobody else sees these miracles. And then uh, God says, go and reveal yourself to Ahab. And so he goes to Ahab uh, to reveal himself. And he said, meet me on Mount Carmel. And there you know the story of, of the 850 false prophets of Baal uh, meet a, uh, uh, Elijah at Mount Carmel. And he said, here's the deal. Let the God that answers by fire, let him be God. And the false prophets build their altar, put their sacrifice on it, and they pray to their God, and God does not answer. And then Elijah says, uh, put four barrels of water on the, on the sacrifice. Put four more barrels of water on the sacrifice. Put four more barrels on the sacrifice. And he soaks the ground, uh, and, and, and the water fills the trenches. Uh, he prays a 65-word prayer, and God gives him a breakthrough. Amen. Can I have an amen? amen? You can't tell me that, that you have been in the ministry or been in the church any length of time and you've never seen the miracle of God work in your life. You can't tell me that you haven't seen the miracle of God work in your life. Look at who you are. You're not what you used to be, and you may not be what you ought to be. Can I have an amen? But thank God you're not what you used to be. 
God has done miracle after miracle after miracle that nobody else can recognize, but you recognize what God has done for you. Somebody said amen. Let me, let, me, let me talk about Elijah for just a minute. E- Elijah was very uh, distraught about a number of things. Number one, he was distraught about the ungodly rule of Ahab. He was disturbed by the ungodliness uh, of Jezebel. How would you like to have a Jezebel in your life? He was more upset about Israel than he was at Ahab or Jezebel. His own people had forsaken the law of their God and was turning to uh, idolatry. How, How did Israel end up in such idolatry that we had to have an Elijah to begin with? You know, God doesn't just throw, just sling out prophets. But there's always a purpose uh, for a prophet before God sends one. Let me say that one more time. There's always a cause uh, for God to have to raise up a prophet to begin with. When a prophet comes on the scene, uh, there's something going on that God is not pleased with. And usually what God is not pleased with did not start that day. It is a process uh, that brings evil to the forefront. In America right now, we are facing a crisis uh, in which America needs uh, a prophetic word from God. Can I, can I just tell you that I, in my lifetime, I, I'm not that old, but in my lifetime, I've seen uh, waves of a move of God. Azusa Street was an awakening in America. Before there was an Azusa Street, uh, Charles Finney uh, uh, went to the East Coast uh, and converted a million and a half people and brought an awakening to America. Evans Roberts brought an awakening to England. Watchman Nee brought an awakening to China. We have seen down through history uh, waves uh, of the move of God uh, that have brought revival to our world and to our nation. We wouldn't be the nation we are had it not been a a number of moves of God in America that have preserved us to this hour. America has had breakthroughs uh, in its past. Uh, And can I tell you, I'm looking right now at the fact that God is bringing a breakthrough to America. We are going to have a great outpouring of the Holy Ghost, and God has already told us that America is going to have a great breakthrough because he said in the last day, saith the Lord, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. Don't look around at what's going on around you. Look at me. I can do all things. Let me just help you here. Quit being disheartened by what's going on around you and look at the little victories that we're seeing across our nation. If God can sustain the widow woman with the oil and the meal because the prophet said it's not going to rain, can I have an amen? If it didn't rain, there wouldn't be a revival in Israel. If it doesn't rain, the widow woman's going to die. But God sustained the widow woman by the miraculous act. It doesn't matter what gasoline costs. It doesn't matter what kind of inflation rate is. God has a church that he is going to preserve while he disturbs America to bring it back to God. We've been praying for years uh, for God to send revival to America. We've been praying for years uh, for God to send a revival to our city. How's he going to do that if he doesn't upset the world? We need to be rejoicing uh, that God is bringing revival to America the way God wants to do it. Please be seated. The process by which Elijah comes to power did not start with Elijah. 
It did not start with Ahab. It did not start with Jezebel. For a fact, it goes all the way back to the United Kingdom under Solomon. Saul ruled Israel for 40 years. Now, whatever you think about King Saul doesn't make any difference, but Saul had a, a lot of good things going for him. As well as he became disobedient, God rejected him, okay? So we know obedience is very important. But Saul didn't have 700 wives and 300 concubines. And David came to the throne, and he ruled Israel for 40 years, and he fought some intense battles for Israel and won them all. And he had more than one wife. And uh, Solomon, when he came to the throne, we know he was the wisest man that ever lived. Now, when you read the story of Solomon, we don't think so. But God said he was a wise man. God baptized him with wisdom. One thing about Solomon is he never fought a battle because he never had any wars. Have you ever thought about why, why Solomon didn't have any wars? I, I, I didn't think you knew. I'm going to give you some secular history here for a few minutes. Solomon, Solomon wasn't at war with anybody. He brought the Queen of Sheba in to see all his buildings, and she said the half hadn't even been told. He decorated Israel. He put architecture in Israel. He built Solomon's temple that in today's monetary standards, it would have cost a billion dollars to build that temple. But that's not the only temple that Solomon built. For a fact, for a fact, we know of at least 700 temples that Solomon built. I bet you didn't even know that. Why did he build 700 temples? The Bible said he married many strange women. Now, that didn't mean the women were strange. It means they were foreigners to Israel. Solomon, in all of his wisdom, knew the wars that David had fought. And for 40 years, David's entire life was filled with war. All of Saul's life, it was filled with war. And Solomon said, there's got to be a way to bring peace to Israel. And so he started marrying the daughters of the kings of these strange lands. And he married 700 wives and made treaties with 700 nations. And there was not one king around him that could attack Israel because they would come against their own daughter. But in order to marry the woman, for every good thing, there's a downside. Amen. The downside of eating too much ice cream is getting fat. He had to agree for each woman that he brought into the palace and brought from their other country, he had to build them a place of worship. And so he built 700 smaller temples for each wife to be comfortable with, with, with Solomon so she'd have a place to worship her own God. And the first thing you know, they got one giant Solomon's temple, but all around them there are 700 small temples uh, to Asheroth and Chemosh and, and the other gods. That's fine as long as the balance of power stays with Jehovah God. As long as God is in control, as long as God's people's in control, there was no problem with that. But then, when Solomon dies, Jeroboam comes to the throne of Israel. There's a divided nation, and, and, uh, and, and 
fast forward all the way to Ahab, well, he tries to follow the example of Solomon, and he marries strange women, and he marries one called Jezebel. Jezebel was the high priestess of, of the Zidonians of, of, of Phoenicia. And, and, and Jezebel was one of the more intelligent women of that day, and she organized the 700 temples built to strange gods in Israel. And the first thing you know, the shift of balance of power has began to take place, and, and now the, the heathens have gotten together, and very suddenly, Jezebel starts eliminating uh, the, the, the priest of the Lord and the prophets of God and had started killing them. And when all of a sudden, the, the heathens uh, are outvoting uh, the religious people, and we see it happening right here in America. The queers didn't used to run America. The gay rights didn't run America. The transgenders didn't run America. And you tell me why that there's so much emphasis today on transgenderism and wokeism and, and gay rights and lesbianism and, and LGBTQ, uh, the alphabet, praise God. <laughs> it's because they've gotten together and they have got political power and now they're outweighing and they're outvoting uh, Christian people. It's the same parallel today. And as long as we allow, as long as we allow those people to rule America, America is going to go down, down, down. But America is starting to wake up. We're tired of Congress being in the bedroom all the time. We need them in the corporate boardroom now. We need them in the oil companies now. Can I have a witness, somebody? And, 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 and today, I was overcome with emotion when I read uh, that the Supreme Court uh, had ruled uh, that, uh, that you have no constitutional right uh, to abortion. We're going to see a war in America. We're going to find out whether or not Christians uh, can unite uh, and say, we fed up and we've gone the last mile. We're going to have revival now. And it might be the tipping point that we need in America to turn America back to God. And so when Elijah steps out, he's angry that, that Israel has allowed the heathen and the pagan to overcome the nation of Israel, which believed in here, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, and now the pagans are ruling Israel. And he steps out, and there he fights battles, and he has a tipping point or a breakthrough on Mount Carmel. And all of a sudden, the fire comes from heaven. And Elijah said, what are we going to do with these false prophets? And they destroy 850 false prophets of Baal. And they destroy the groves. Uh, and they tear down the temples uh, that all of Solomon's wives uh, had built uh, and brought revival back to the nation. Can I have a witness, somebody? How are we going to have revival in America? How are we going to have an awakening in America? Every church has got to stand up and say, I'm going to do my part. I'm going to win somebody. I'm going to reach somebody. There, there's one person in your city that can turn your city upside down if you can find that one person. Now, I'm going to make a statement here. Please don't be offended by the statement. But... If your church was going to have revival, it would have already had revival. What happens is that when converts come into a church, they come in on fire for God, and, and then they become acclimated into the church, and all of a sudden their attention turns inward to the church, and they lose their outward vision. And if we don't have constant new vision coming into the church, our churches are going to become stagnant. Right. 
Now, I want to talk about the anatomy of revival. When we came to Wichita 45 years ago, the church voted me in thinking that I was a novice. The church knew absolutely nothing about me. There were two other pastors, great pastors, by the way, that had tried out for this church. And uh, for some reason or another, the church rejected two very seasoned pastors. And uh, someone had mentioned to Brother Stanford that he needed to call me. Brother Stanford said, well, I don't know him. And the guy said, well, why don't you just call him? I resigned my church in Lake Charles on a Wednesday night left town, came back on Saturday, and I had a phone call from Brother Stanford waiting for me. And he said, Brother Cohen said, we'd like you to come try out for Wichita. And I said, well, how did you know I had resigned? He said, I didn't know. I said, okay. And uh, what Brother Stanford didn't know is, one month before I resigned, I received a call from Tulsa asking me to come take a church in Tulsa, and I told him I don't try out for churches while I'm a pastor. That kind of quiet in the crowd. I don't believe that a pastor that's pastoring should go try out for another church. If you don't get it, come back and fall back in love with your own church. That's like committing adultery. If you don't like the woman you commit adultery with, forget her, come back to your wife. And, uh, but I had resigned, and I, and I got that phone call. And so I, I came uh, to Wichita to try out. The Lord had already spoken to Sister Cole and I that we were going to go to a city of 300,000, and there we would find our life's work. From the time I got up from the altar seeking the Holy Ghost, I became a soul winner. I can't tell you how that happened. All I can tell you is that within 20 minutes after I started speaking in tongue, I was wearing a pair of blue Bermuda shorts, half naked at the altar, with my hands raised, getting the Holy Ghost, 20 minutes later, God called me to preach. You don't have to believe that. I'm just telling us what happened. And because I was qual called didn't mean I was qualified. I want to make that clear, okay? And, and I spent four and a half years in college, and all I'd done for four and a half years uh, uh, was so winning. I, I won so many people in college, it's hard to believe. For a fact, my last year of college, I won 29 young people to God, of which half of them are either pastors or pastor's wives today. And, uh, and so uh, when I got out of college, we started evangelizing, and I couldn't preach my way out of a paper bag. But, but I had one thing going for me is I had a strong desire to win souls. That's all I had going for me. Uh, I, I didn't have a mother and dad that was backing me. I, they were heathens. Uh, my, my own pastor didn't know anybody, so he couldn't recommend me. Uh, and, and, and I started preaching in little tiny churches, little tiny country churches. A lot of them were independent or free churches uh, that would let me preach, and, and I'd go and preach. Uh, but I knew one thing, uh, that if I didn't have a breakthrough in that church, uh, I would soon l run out of places to preach. Now, Necessity is the author of a breakthrough. Can I say that again? I said necessity is the author of a breakthrough. If, if, if you can go out and preach and come back and if you have revival, fine. If you don't have revival, fine. That's not going to get you a breakthrough. If, if you can go out and preach, uh, and if you're not successful, you can fall back on your secular job and make it, uh, you're not going to have a breakthrough. There's got to be a necessity for a breakthrough. And, uh, and so I'd go to these small churches, and I would preach, and uh, I'd leave the, leave the evangelist quarters or wherever I was staying, and I'd go knock doors. And, and I'd bring visitors to that church for the first time in a long time. I'd pray people through and would have to uh, clean out the baptistry and uh, uh, repair the baptistry, fill it with water to get the new people baptized because they hadn't baptized anybody in 10 years. 
And I said, I can't afford to go to one church and not have a breakthrough because I preach to put beans in a pot. I preach to eat. If I don't pray people through, I'm not going to have a place to preach. If I don't have a place to preach, I'm not going to get an offering. If I don't get an offering, my wife's going to be very upset. I mean, my wife does love to eat three meals a day. And I started having breakthrough in these smaller churches. And then I, I, I gradually got where I could preach at a UPC church. And you know what? They need the same kind of revival as the little independent churches out in the middle of the country needed. Can I have a witness there? And I'd go to a church, uh, and, I, and, and, and the average evangelist would have a one-week revival or a two-week revival. I'd go and say 10 and 12 weeks uh, because I got out and knocked doors. Uh, I got people to come to church. Uh, I, I prayed them through the Holy Ghost. I helped disciple them while I was there. And when I left there, I left more people on the pews uh, than they had in the church to begin with. And finally, I got to started preaching in some of the bigger churches, and I did the same thing in the bigger churches. I didn't put my ministry, listen to me now, I will not put my ministry in somebody else's hands. We'll say that one more time. I will not put my ministry in somebody else's hands. I go to a church, uh, and the preacher would not let me pray, and the preacher would not let me knock doors. Uh, I hooked on my little trailer, and I said, the revival's over. I'm going to where I can do my thing. Because I can't afford to go to a church uh, and not have revival. Brother C.R. Free says uh, that an evangelist, uh, when he starts out on the field, uh, if he has 11 places that he goes to and doesn't have a breakthrough, he's finished as an evangelist. But uh, he said if he goes and has two breakthroughs, uh, he's set for life. I think it's very important we understand the concept of a breakthrough. We can have little miracles all along the way, but we got to fix in our mind what a breakthrough is. Right, right. Do we want 50 people to get the Holy Ghost, 25 people to get the Holy Ghost? Do we want 100 people to get the Holy Ghost? Do we want to run a church uh, running 25? Do we want to run a church running 50? Do we want a church running 100? Do we want a church running 200? Do we want a church running 500? Do we want a church running 1,000? What is the mentality of your breakthrough? Someone asked me one time, he said, Pastor, uh, I'm running 100, and I can't get past that. How do I reach 200? I said, you really want to know? Uh, he said, yes. He said, I want to know. I said, got a pad, got a, got a notebook? And he said, yes. I said, bring it to me. And I wrote 200 on the first page of that paper. I said, I want you to write 200 in a column. 200, 200, 200, 200, 200. Move over a little bit. Write 200, 200, 200, 200. Then move over again on the third column. Write 200, 200, 200, 200, 200. Turn the page and do three more columns of 200. Turn the next page. Run three more columns of 200. I want you to fill that notebook up with nothing but 200. I want you to see 200 in your sleep. I want you to see 200 in your dreams. I want you to dream 200 when you go to bed at night and you lay down, to, uh, kneel down to pray. You say, uh, I, I pray the Lord my 200 to keep. If I should 200 before I wake, I pray the Lord my 200 to keep. Praise God. You got to pray 200. You got to believe 200. You got to talk 200. You got to walk 200. It's not the will of God for Kansas to always have little bitty tiny churches. Uh, it is the will of God for every church to have a genuine outpouring of the Holy but we got to have our own breakthrough. Amen. Amen. Brother Tim Waits, uh, you can run 10, 10, 10 all you want to, but now you got to put on that paper, i got to run 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, and then you got to run 30, 30, 30, 30. Then you got to run four. Well, yeah. You say, well, you don't have problem in your church like we have in ours. When I, when I used to run 20, I dreamed of running 1,000. One day I woke up and run a thousand, wishing I could run twenty again. <laughs> you have five cases of adultery, ten cases of smoking, and you got to have a revival in the midst of all that. Be seated. When I came here, the church had gone through three splits in six months. We owned the Guinness Book of World Records for the most splits in a six-month period of time. We lost a group in January. We lost a group in June. 
And then the former pastor took a split with him to Boston. And uh, the people that left all sat on the back four rows. I had a wide open space, first 12 rows. They told me the church ran 369 when I was going to try out. I came up and tried out. The night I tried out, there was 19 people present. I thought, where's the other 350? They didn't tell me the church had been through three split. <laughs> but God had spoke to me in, in, in Stockton that I was going to go to a city of 300,000, and I'd find my life's work. And uh, I didn't have, I, I had resigned my church, had no income coming in, and I got to the city limit signs of Wichita out here uh, on I-35. They said, Wichita, Kansas, 300,000. I pulled over, got out, talked in tongues, and wept under that sign. I had, I, had, I had an envelope in my pocket where two years before, God had told me I was going to go to a city of 300,000, and there I'd find my life's work. I held that envelope up. I said, God, this is my city. This is it. I had no idea how big the church was. I took the city of Wichita right there. Put that envelope back in my pocket, came and preached to 19 people. And the pastor said, if the board wants you and they elect you, will you take the church? I said, I will. I, that was stupid. <laughs> take a church that's filled with hate and bitterness and anger. And then, and, and then the first, first week on a job, they said, if the neighboring pastor walks in here, we're going to pick him up and throw him through the lattice outside. I th they hated the neighboring pastor. I, I, I had never faced such hate in my life. I didn't know Christians could hate like that. But they were mad at the people that took the saints, and they were mad at Brother Stanford for taking all the tithe payers with him. And I started pastoring. First week in town, a couple came and said, uh, Pastor, we need to talk with you. I said, okay, what can I do for you? He said, we, we'll take the month of August and decide where we want to go to church. I said, what? I said, you want to take the month of August and what? He said, we want to take the month of August to decide where we want to go to church. I said, what do you mean by that? He said, well, we know this church. He said, we've been visiting the other church, and we're going to visit back and forth so we can decide which church we want to go to. I said, no, no. That ain't going to happen. I said, you got three days to make up your mind. If you come here to church, you're going to cut tithe with the other church. If you go to the other church, you're going to cut tithe with this church. And I said, if you decide to go to the other church, believe me, you can never come back here again. He said, who, who are you to tell me what to do? I said, I'm the pastor. I've been voted in. They can't vote me out till I have a business meeting. And I don't call business meetings until I get a majority. <laughs> Preachers are dumb as stumps. You got 49 people for you and 50 people against you, and you call a business meeting and want to have a vote? At least wait you got 51 people on your side. He said, Pastor, I don't like you at all. I said, good, I don't like you either. I said, go ahead and go to the other church. And they did. And they lasted about three weeks. I don't know what happened from there on because they couldn't come back to my church. I said, we're not here to hate one another. So we started having, I started knocking doors. My wife and I would leave the church at 9 o'clock on Saturday morning, and we'd knock doors from 9 o'clock Saturday morning to 9 o'clock Saturday night trying to get one visitor to come on Sunday morning so we'd have somebody we could preach to to get the Holy Ghost. You grow your church one member at a time. I'm going to say that one more time. You grow your church one family at a time. One family at a time. There are 52 revivals a year with six days to prepare for every revival. It's not what you do once a year that's going to bring revival. It's what you do day in and day out. If you don't knock doors uh, during the week and you don't visit people during the week, you don't invite people during the week, then don't expect anybody to show up when it comes Sunday. Hello? 
And so I started bringing people, and, and I found out when I'd bring a family in, I'd won to God. The people that was there got with them, filled them with such bitterness, they dropped out, and I was right back where I started. So I said, here's what I'm going to do. I said, I, I had a vision of a breakthrough. I had a vision of a great breakthrough in Wichita. And so I started teaching Bible studies. I was teaching 15 Bible studies a week. I was teaching Bible studies Monday night, Tuesday night, Wednesday night before church, Thursday night, Friday night, four on Saturday, and two on Sunday between services. I was teaching Bible study in the morning, in the afternoon, and at night. And uh, I, I was literally working myself to death the best I knew how. And then, then I, I, I realized I, I got so many people who want Bible study, I can't get there, buddy. And so I started building groups out of each Bible study. I never start with a group. I start with one family. And when I get that family converted, and when I say converted, they get to believe in what I'm preaching. Not salvation, converted. And then I would ha have them bring in another family. And we got that person converted, we bring in another family. And, I, and all of a sudden, I got 11 Bible study groups uh, uh, and, and, and four individual Bible studies. And I had 257 center adults uh, in 15 different Bible studies. And I wouldn't let any of them come to church. For three months, I preached the same exact sermon. I preached the same exact sermon for three months. Forgive or you're going to go to hell. I had one man, one man came to me and said, when are you going to change sermons? I said, just as soon as you forgive. I said, you don't deserve a second sermon until you obey the first one. Y'all missed that one. That was a good one. I said, you don't deserve a second sermon until you learn how to obey the first one. We don't preach to entertain people. We preach to change people. I had somebody stand up. And I preached on forgiveness one night about the fifth time or sixth time in a row. And she said, I'd rather go to hell than forgive him. I said, and right before the whole congregation, I burned out. I said, that's exactly where you're going to go. And the whole congregation got mad at me. But my Bible says if you don't forgive, you're going to hell. One thing I, I can say, I thank God for Kansas because they taught me how to forgive. You don't know whether you can forgive or not unless you have the opportunity to be offended. And you better hope and pray that somewhere along the line you get offended uh, so you can find out whether or not you got the ability to forgive. Hey, folks, I'm, I'm not in a preaching business to entertain people. I'm in the preaching business uh, to save our world, to save our city, to save our state. We need one another. We're not in competition with one another. We need one another. We got to help one another. We got to do our best to help our brothers, praise God. I was so thrilled to be able to help Brother Tim Waits when he went to Parsons. I was so thrilled when Brother Mark Waits went to Coffeeville. I was so thrilled when Brother Beachy went to Hutchison. And I'm so thrilled that Brother Vangada went to Wellington. We got to reach our cities any way we can. But Every one of us need a breakthrough. Amen. Be seated. I'm almost finished. And so I had 257 adults in 15 separate Bibles. Now, that's not strange, Brother Forsythe, stand up. I, I guarantee you, uh, Brother Forsythe has averaged, averaged, averaged 18 Bible studies a week for over 40 years. And any way you slice it, that comes to over 32,000 times uh, he's been in somebody's home and taught Bible study. And I guarantee you most of his Bible studies now are group Bible studies, praise God. Thank you, Brother Foresight. In those Bible studies, I taught them for nine months. I wouldn't, they'd say, where's your church at? I said, you don't need to know right now. Don't you have a building somewhere? You, you don't need to know right now. Everything's all right. Just let's, let's keep having Bible study. And, and, and then it got where in one Bible study, I went to the Bible study, and they said, uh, Pastor, you got any kids? I said, I've got three. He said, where are they at? I said, they're at the babysitters. They said, you hire a babysitter to teach us a Bible study? 
I said, yes, sir. Oh, he said, we can't have that. He gets up, goes to the kitchen, pulls out the red Folgers coffee can with that black lid on it, opens that black lid, dumps the coffee grounds in the garbage disposal, puts that black plastic lid back on it, takes a butcher knife and jams a hole in it, walks out among, th- I had 37 that Bible study, walks out and he said, okay, folks, we've got to provide for the babysitter, Annie up. And uh, they anted up. They gave Sister Corn with a bucket, and uh, we left the Bible study, and we resorted back to our evangelistic days. In our evangelistic days, the preacher, preacher would give us a check, and we'd stop at the first traffic, uh, uh, street light and open that check to see what it was. We pulled down the street, and I said, open that can. There were $2,000 in that can. You know what? I took that can back next Tuesday night and said, here, fill it back up. <laughs> And for months and months and months, uh, they put $2,000 uh, in that coffee can. I've been drinking Folgers coffee ever since. Uh, nothing like waking up with Folgers in your cup. I had three groups uh, that were paying the tithe in the Bible study, and I'd bring, bring the tithe and give it to Sister Dugan to count it, and we started remodeling the church and repainting the church and putting in new carpet, and, and the, the poor little people that was there were paying $1,000 a month tithe, offering the mission building fund and everything. They couldn't figure out where the money was coming from. I, it was coming through my Bible studies, but I hadn't had a breakthrough yet. I was working my fingers to the bone, but didn't have, a, didn't have a breakthrough. Brother Bankins, one day when God lets you pastor your own church and you start teaching Bible study, everything that you've learned here is going to become so valuable, and then God's going to give you that great, enormous breakthrough. <laughs> Elijah, Elijah, you got to go down by the brook a while and let the buzzards feed you. Elijah, you got to go to the widow's house uh, and let the widow woman sustain you for a while. You're going to have a breakthrough, but keep on the little miracles. Keep on doing the thing that you know how to do. Had a young man going to meet our board uh, this week for license and had license all filled out and everything done. Minister Central, all that. I said, how many Bible studies are you teaching? He said, well, I'm not teaching Bible studies. I said, Did you just wait until the next time. I'll let you meet the board next time after you start teaching Bible studies. I don't want to go to seed on this, okay? I, I, I'm, I, Bible study is not the only way to build a church, okay? I'm, I'm not even trying to emphasize it. What I'm trying to say is this. You've got to have a breakthrough. And when you don't have a breakthrough, you get frustrated. And when you get frustrated, you get to do all kind of crazy stuff. But you need to hang on to what you're doing. Add to it. Can I have an amen? I had 257 adults. Still had a handful of people sitting on the back four rows. I was dealing with all kinds. I was dealing with some of the craziest stuff at church. I'd come to church and, and, and preach like the house so far, I'd close my eyes and pretend I was in a Bible study. I, 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 pretending I was preaching to that 37 in one Bible study. I had 55 in another Bible study. I had 69 in another Bible study. And I'd close my eyes and preach to those hateful people and those that was hurt and crushed and bruised and wounded. But I didn't see the brokenness and the wounds and the crushing. All I could see is i got to have a breakthrough. we all got to have a breakthrough. Our church needs a breakthrough. I need a breakthrough. So after about nine months, I brought an evangelist in for three nights, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. And I said, all my Bible said, I said, now, we, all y'all got to come to church. They all came to church. We had 157 adults pray through in three nights. That's the ones that stuck. They didn't backslide. Had 100, we had 157 adult saints to our church in three nights. Now, was it lined up to holiness? Not on your life. My God, on Sunday night, we looked like a Methodist church. We looked like the local bar. I'm telling you, we had one woman that they melted her and poured her in her britches. 
She went through a, a weed whacker and whacked all of her hair off. She had earrings about that big around, flopping down on her ears, came on her shoulder, and, and she had a, a Heart of Davidson Hell's Angels coat on. And she got the Holy Ghost and come dancing down the aisle, her earring flopping over her, her bald head. Praise God. She had a pair of a black uh, a Harley Davidson boots on. And I thought, oh my God, this is what you gave. This is the breakthrough you gave me. <laughs> Where are you at? You just thought you had problems. But you know what? She got the Holy Ghost, and we worked with them. And Linda Adams just died here a few weeks ago. Am I right, Brother Anderson? But you ought to have seen her the first time she came to the house of God. And, and I had three visiting preachers come visit our revival. And they stood right there with their arms folded and said, Yeah, Cornwell done gone charismatic. Yeah. We're, we're not going to kill each other, folks. Right. I said, We're not going to kill each other. You tell me you got a card in your pocket, I believe that you believe what I believe. But we're going to help you with your new converts. We're going to help teach your new convert. Can I have an amen? It wouldn't bother me if Kansas woke up next week uh, and we looked like a charismatic church uh, because we had some new people come through. We're going to put up with them until we start looking apostolic again. But we're not going to run them off. We're not going to damage them. We're not going to uh, injure them. We want you to feel free to bring your sinners to our meeting. My God, you work too hard to find people to run them off. On Sunday night, on Sunday night, in the midst of the excitement, we, I called a business meeting. I said, praise God. I'm a, look at these people praying to them. How many want them to be members of the first bit of the church? And they all raised their hand. I said, vote it in. Then I became the dictator. Nine months before, they wanted to run me off. But they can't do it no more. First thing I done was I fired the board. I fired them. I said, I don't need you three guys anymore. We're going to have a business meeting in January. We're going to vote in three trustees, but three men ain't going to tell me what I can and can't do. The whole church can, but you three can't. We set the church in order. But I had a breakthrough. I want you to have a breakthrough. I want Brother Pagan to have a hundred soul revival, not just a hundred people speaking in tongues, but I need him to have a hundred new people added to his church tomorrow. I need Brother Khan to have a breakthrough. My God, Topeka needs to be running 500. I believe there's a breakthrough in Topeka. The devils of hell are, are, are fighting him all over that government place, uh, and he has to fight the demons of government, the, the, th uh, the strongholds of the enemy, but you got to have a breakthrough. I pray that Brother Dormer, God, I feel the Holy Ghost. I pray that Brother Dormer stand up uh, and have his breakthrough in Jesus' name. <laughs> Brother Bailey, we need a breakthrough in Dodge City. Brother Milby, so, uh, uh, Ark City, need, you, all you need is a breakthrough. But a breakthrough starts with a vision. It starts with a desire. And you got to say, it's necessary for my church to survive to have a breakthrough. Amen. The devil has had his hand on Coffeeville too long. And then we're having a, a break in Coffeeville. Got new people coming. But I'm looking for that breakthrough in which God thrusts you to the forefront all at one time. Let's stand together. I, 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 I hope and pray that I have not come across here arrogant. I, that's not been my purpose at all. I am burdened. I am so burdened, not just for this church. I love, I love First Pentecostal. My days the First Pentecostal Church are numbered. I know that. But I have a burden for our state. I see a fire burning across 
uh, Kansas uh, like they did in the days of the Indian tribes when they burned the state off, praise God, and set the state ablaze. Amen. And after that blaze, uh, there came rich green grass uh, that grew back uh, into a great host uh, of food for everybody. Father, I pray in the name of Jesus that you would, first of all, forgive me for, of any arrogancy here today. Father, please. Please, I pray in the name of Jesus. How many times have I yearned to have a breakthrough for someone else? But Lord, I can't have a breakthrough for somebody else. I, I want to inspire them to have their own breakthrough. I want them to have their own testimony of what God has done. Holy Spirit, we got cities in Kansas, Kansas City, and Overland Park, and Olathe, and Gardner, and Shawnee. Oh, Lord, we got Topeka, and Lawrence, and Manhattan, and Salina, and Russell, and Garden City, and Dodd City, and Liberal, and Pratt. McPherson, we got Ark City and Coffeyville and Independence. Holy Spirit, give us a vision of a breakthrough. Give us a vision of a breakthrough. Shut up. In the name of Jesus, 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 hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah, 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 pastor, if you want to break through, hallelujah. Close your eyes and lift your hands and say, God, my church needs a breakthrough. Um, i got to confess to you, First Pentecostal, we need a fresh breakthrough. Pastor Scott, you need a breakthrough, son. you got to have a breakthrough for yourself. Brother Haney, you got to have your breakthrough for yourself. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Brother Beachy, you got to have a breakthrough for yourself. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Father, I pray this morning this afternoon, that you would bless every pastor. I pray, Lord, that you would touch every church. But I pray most of all for every preacher. Help us to understand that we've got to have our own breakthrough. I, I don't know what each one's breakthrough looks like or represents, 
But I'm asking you that the angel that went to Cornelius' house and the angel that went to Simon's rooftop, whether it be one angel or two, would you bring those angels into our city? And would you release those two angels in our community to help the preacher and the sinner get together? Father, you know who it is in our city that you're wanting to save. And I pray that you'd help us to intersect with that man or woman that could turn our cities upside down. Lord God, I pray, I pray in the name of Jesus. Holy Spirit, in the name of Jesus. God, let, let there be a fresh vision and a fresh awakening among us. Lord, help us to, help us to unite ourselves together. We're not islands unto ourselves. Father, we don't, we don't fellowship on the basis of the size of our church. Lord, we, we fellowship on the basis that we serve the same God. We, we serve the same Savior. Lord God, we all have feelings and emotions together. And Lord, I pray, Lord, that we would support one another and heal one another. God, I pray for that pastor's wife right now. God, I pray for that precious pastor's wife that you would touch her right now. Touch that precious woman in the name of Jesus. God, give her a special anointing. Give her a special treat. I pray, Lord, for our pastor's children. God, our pastor's children are, are, are frustrated. And Lord, they, they know that there's a revival somewhere. And God, help them to have their breakthrough in the name of Jesus. God, we'll be careful to give you the honor and the praise and the glory in Jesus' name. And everybody said amen. Hallelujah. Would you take just a moment and love one another? Would you take just a moment and, and just greet one another in Jesus' name and say, I'm going to have my breakthrough. Praise the Lord. What a word. That was awesome. Anybody ready for your breakthrough? Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The Global Missions uh, Department here in Kansas District wants to give all of our preachers and their families that are present here today, we would like to invite you over to um, Station 8 Barbecue. It is, uh, uh, the address should be on the screen. They'll put it up there for us. Praise God. So come on over, and uh, they are going to, they're ready to serve us now. But any time between 1.15, it says 1.30 there, but it can be 1.15. That's fine. Uh, we can go on over, and uh, we will be picking up the tab for that. We appreciate your giving to Global Missions. Everybody say $11.27. $11.27 wins a soul on the mission field. And uh, you can't go, but you can give. We also have our missionary here, Brother and Sister Yates. So good to have you with us. You are a blessing going to Tanzania and connecting with Pastor Samuel. Pastor Samuel, how many have heard of the truth conferences that we've been doing in Kenya? Pastor Samuel uh, has received truth, preaches truth. He works in the Congo. He works in Kenya. Uh, he's trying to get into Tanzania. He works in Malawi. He, is, he operates kind of an apostleship there and uh, has many, many churches and he has come. This is his first time to the United States of America. Why don't we give him a welcome? Praise God. We love you. Pastor Samuel, praise God. When I delivered, when I was delivering truth, I remember looking over and he was sitting over here and tears were just streaming down his face as he was receiving the oneness of God. And uh, so thankful for that here to be with us. And it's such an exciting thing. But uh, if you want to give to missions, we're asking everybody to support 1127. Put that out there for your young people, your Sunday school classes, lifting your PIM so we can get more souls saved on the mission field. We appreciate that. Pastors, if you would like to support 
We're asking if you possibly can. We try to get one missionary here every year. We'd like to pick up at least three to five PIMs for them. And also, they have switched up their schedule to be in our district next week. So if you'd like to schedule them to be with you, it would be great, to, great for you to schedule them. I think they're scheduled Sunday morning. That's the only thing we have them on the schedule for, so we can fill them up if you are available. God bless you. See you over at, I almost said Section 8, at Station 8 Barbecue. You don't want Section 8 Barbecue. Station 8 Barbecue. God bless you.